so one of the things I wanted to begin asking the two of you about, and I don't, actually don't know the answer to this story, is just in this age and era of hyper-partisanship where our politics is reflected in the ads and the campaigns, are so divisive, so vitriolic at times, how do the two of you come to be friends and actually get to know each other? What, what was the backstory there? Well, I, um, well, I guess we met... Um, one I, of these post-mortem type... One of, the, one of these <laughs> yeah. post-mortem campaign... Yeah. Um, Where you're forced to be together on Forced stage? to be together, in my case, in the agony of defeat. <laughs> and David was uh, magnanimous in victory, and we've become friends over the years. And, yeah. um, and, I've had, and over the years, I've had a number of occasions to um, come to the university um, uh, and uh, you know, participate in, in events that David was running. But I... Um, I've also become very good friends over, to, over the last couple of years with David Pluff, um, who ran the campaign. And David and I um, both went to the University of Delaware. He was a couple of years older than, than I. And we were both three credits short of our degrees. Um, that uh, is it, common it, among people was, in politics, by the way. And it was the same math class. And, um, and so we went, we went to the University um, of Delaware about a year after the campaign, and they made a big deal about it. We're, we're the founding fellows, he and I, of a school, a new school of communications and policy that I suspect will ultimately be the Biden Center, where, where, his, where his papers are stored. And the president of the university asked to see us privately, and, he, and after, and he said, he, he, he said, you know, you guys, he goes, we're very proud of you both. He goes, you're killing us with the degree thing. <laughs> he said, you have to, he, he goes, he goes, you have to finish. Um, you have to take the class. He goes, he goes, he goes, he goes I've handpicked um, a very special professor who can help you both deal with your math phobia. The and, same guy who um, works with a football team. And um, no, it was, <laughs> and I, um, and so David, D David took the class first and we would talk and I would, you know, all the time I said, God, this is hard. He was like, oh, it's terrible. It's, you know, I'm up at one in the morning doing my math homework every night. And, um, but people said, you know, how could you guys be, be friends? And I said, you know, I said, we both have kids the same age. Um, we've both spent a lot of our careers running political campaigns. Um, we both grew up in working class families, mine in New Jersey, his in, his in Delaware. Um, I said, how many people on the planet do you think I have more in common with than this guy? Um, you know, we, we differ in our political outlook, but, you know, our lives are, are very similar. And so that was the basis of a, of a friendship. And, you know, in, the Dave, in David's case, um, you know, I, I, everyone who knows David knows how generous and magnanimous he is and brilliant and just, you know, someone I personally admire at a, at a very I'm high I'm ceding the rest level. of my time to Steve. Well, let me just say, um, I, I love people who are willing to get in the arena, who care enough. And, you know, I, I, I'm with Teddy Roosevelt. I like the, 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 he said, the man in the arena. I like people in the arena, people who uh, uh, devote themselves to democracy, to this very important process of electing people to office. And, who, and, and very few people know the exhilarations that are associated with that. And so there's a common, you know, you bond with folks who... Uh, who uh, who do that work? And I, yes, we have different views. That's what m makes a democracy. I mean, you 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 argue over uh, different views. But I honor Steve for the passion that he's brought to us. He's worked in the White House as I did, done public service, and he's a very very smart and thoughtful guy. So I, I enjoy his company, and we're really honored to have him as a fellow at the Institute of Politics uh, this quarter. So our young people are, are, are having a chance to tap into that wisdom. And I should say also, I apologize to all of you who remember Steve Edwards from his afternoon program on WBEZ. I, I didn't realize when we plucked him to work at the Institute of Politics that I would get hate mail <laughs> from listeners of WBEZ. I didn't even think people uh, who listen to WBEZ could write hate letters. <laughs> 
And, uh, but uh, uh, your loss has been our gain because he's a terrific uh, executive director for the IOP, so I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. Well, and I see the balance of my time to you, Dave. Okay. <laughs> well, we ought to thank these folks, too, for being here on such a nice day, even though I suspect this is just a way of avoiding the beginning of the Bears game. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, and one of the things that's actually been such an honor and a joy for me about working at the Institute of Politics with you, David, and, and with you this fall, Steve, is seeing the dynamic that the two of you are talking about. The people who can be committed partisans, um, can be deeply, deeply um, focused on a particular policy agenda, can actually enjoy each other's company, respect the other side, the other person, why don't we see more of this reflected in our politics? I mean, I think it's the central question of our time right now. Um, I think that uh, a couple, I guess a year and a half ago, one of, the, one of this country's great heroes, uh, Senator Daniel Inouye of Hawaii, passed away. And he was an extraordinary man. Um, he was the first elected representative from Hawaii he was uh, a bona fide war hero, Medal of Honor recipient in Italy, um, where he served when Japanese Americans were able to enlist in the army with the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the old Japanese unit. He um, led an assault on a German position. Um, he was shot three times, uh, first in the stomach, but did not deter him um, from leading um, destruction of the first pillbox, the second, um, he was shot in the um, leg, and the third, he literally, he lost his, he lost his arm. He was blown off, and he, um, with his one remaining arm, uh, machine gunned and grenaded, um, you know, the pillbox and, and, and fell backwards. And he spent years um, in hospital um, recuperating after the war. And he became friends with another wounded soldier there and taught him to play bridge. Um, his friend said to him one day, what are you going to do when you get out of here? And he said, I have no idea. I really haven't thought about it. And his friend said, I think I'm going to go into politics. So in 1959, when Inouye gets elected to the House of Representatives, he sends a uh, note to his old friend from the hospital. And he says, here I am. Where are you? And so that old man who was his friend, came to pay his last respects to Senator Inouye and approached the ropes of, that surrounded Inouye's coffin um, in a wheelchair. And he um, got to those ropes and he, and he said, Danny wouldn't want to see me in this chair. And he stood up and he saluted that casket with his good arm. And that man was Bob Dole. And... Um, we had a generation of politicians who fought a real existential evil um, that was a threat to extinguish our values, our liberties, and I think that generation understood what unites all of us as Americans far outweighs any political differences that we have. And that we may be each other's opponents, but we must never be each other's enemies. And when you hear the language on uh, the cable news shows, on talk radio that refers to our fellow Americans that we have differences with as our enemies, hatred, um, I think it is a result of people losing sight and becoming unmoored from what unites us. And I think that one of the things is we have another generation, and one of the young men um, you know, who's a fellow former congressman from Pennsylvania, you know, Patrick Murphy, you know, he and I have talked about this. And I think you have another generation of Americans uh, who are returning from war who understand that they're not each other's enemies because they have political differences. I mean, so does that make you optimistic that I, this I, I am, is changing? I am, I am optimistic. I'm optimistic about the country's, you know, look, people, you know, we, Dave and I were talking backstage, you know, we, we live in an era where I think one of the defining issues of our time is the collapse of trust in our institutions. Um, but people would have lost a lot of money over a lot of years, you know, betting short on America. And um, I think the country is enormously resilient. 
Um, and, I, and I think we are, when you, and I do a fair amount of international travel for business. We're the most competitive place on earth, best place to start a business in, to invest in. Um, we have enormous advantages in this, in this country, and I just think that there are better days ahead. Absolutely. The, the real question, though, is also how are we going to get there? I mean, you mentioned the media. We also know about um, the, 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 the role that money's playing. Um, the incentives for politicians in office. What is it that's driving the current state of affairs as you look at, say, even just the, the, the cycle in Congress right now? Well, look, I think uh, we, we live in a time of enormous change. Um, and a lot of that change is, is wrought by technology, by uh, globalization, forces that are moving very quickly. And uh, they've had economic impacts that have been disorienting for a lot of people. I think they create uh, a sense of alienation and dissatisfaction with the political system uh, because it hasn't been able to ameliorate the hard edge of some of that. Um, and, uh, you know, every, and the media environment, um, there are two elements of the media environment. First of all, we've got social media, which is at once empowering and, and also isolating and atomizing. Uh, we're not all listening to the same conversations. W oftentimes we're, I know there was a piece in the Times disputing this this morning as to whether people are seeking out the uh, media sources that are affirming their view. I think a lot of people do actually. I, I disagree with the social scientists they've interviewed. I think that's pretty clear. Um, I mean, why is it that you know, 49% of Republicans uh, fear Ebola, uh, being infected by Ebola, but only 36% uh, of Democrats. I mean, I just think people get their news from uh, uh, different uh, sources. Uh, so I think that, and then there's, the, there's this, the competitive news environment, which takes a story. I mean, I'm just kind of segueing into something that's bugging me right now, but <laughs> the... Uh, you know, this Ebola story is sort of a parable of modern politics and media uh, because uh, it is advantageous for cable news stations, for uh, news, uh, news operations that are losing altitude uh, to, uh, to have a crisis so that they can get eyeballs on their programming. It is advantageous for politicians to react to that crisis uh, especially a few weeks before the election. And so you saw a thing, you know, not to in any way minimize Ebola, and certainly the people in West Africa are uh, suffering greatly. But, you know, you, as, you have as much chance of being infected by Ebola as you do of winning the Powerball. And yet people are kind of walking in spontaneously into hospitals when they feel nauseous, and they're demanding Ebola tests. Uh, and, you know, that's unhealthy. So we've got this, all these unsettling developments that are, you know, and we have a changing, the last one I would mention is the changing demographics of the country, um, and which has always been in the history of the country kind of a, a, a focal point for friction and, 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 and uh, kind of political turmoil. Um, and, you know, the country, we're becoming a... a I mean, it's almost a oxymoron, but a majority-minority kind of, I mean, it, by, in not too long, you know. Uh, but the demographic changes. The yeah. demographic changes will be, you know, will be more and more evident. And we see it in our elections. I think there's a reaction. There's a reaction to that. All these things are at play. Well, I, I want to come back and talk about some of the structural things. But, but Steve, I mean, you have said before that um, there are a lot of reasons why Americans feel uneasy right now. And it's not just Ebola. It's you look around the world, you look at your pocketbook. I mean, you've called this sort of a perfect storm of, of, uh, uh, of worry, I guess. Um, what, what's happening right now with, with this administration, we, with this time? With we, um, we live in turbulent times. Um, we see the era of um, American hegemony, which lasted from roughly the end of the Cold War, um, you know, through, let's say, you know, the first years of this um, century, uh, beginning, to, beginning to end as, um, you know, other countries, China, um, 
you know, begin to assert themselves regionally. It doesn't mean we're not the most powerful nation in the world with the most powerful military, but there are other countries that are rising that are asserting their prerogatives in, in their near regions. Russia, of course, um, being one of them, president of Russia, Russian nationalist, um, who is um, asserting, you know, the power of that country. Russia has always been a great world power uh, for a thousand years. Um, and, and will likely be for as long as people live on Earth. And so we have an accumulation of issues um, in a soft economy, um, still recovering from uh, the financial crisis in 2009. One of the things that David pointed out, you know, I think it's very clear that there's a separation now between the Wall Street economy and the Main Street economy uh, in, the, in the country. Um, there's a lot of people in the middle class, working class folks who are working harder and doing more, getting paid less, um, falling behind. We have, whether it's Ebola, um, we have instances, you know, where government business uh, are just not doing the things at a service level that, you know, people have an expectation that they would, that they would do. And as David pointed out, you know, we have a media culture that, is not, you know, set to calm, but, you know, rather to inflame, you know, in the, in the name of ratings. We have po a political system um, where we have, you know, the amount of money in politics, um, I think, is, is incredibly destructive. Um, you know, Rahm Emanuel has said we used to live in a country where voters pick the politicians. Now we live in a country where the politicians pick the voters. We have, we have 35 or so out of 435 house seats, you know, 35 competitive races. And so we, we have a lot of strains on the, we have a lot of strains on the system. Um, and in a turbulent time, um, you see, you see um, all of these things, all of these things combining. And of course, we, you know, look to the Middle East, um, you see essentially the Sunni Shia civil war you know, playing out transnationally across boundaries. Uh, this ISIS threat, I think, is real and significant, but I do think that there's a tendency to look at events happening in our own time and to think that it's either the best of times or the, it's the worst of times. Um, the reality is, I think when you look at whatever the issues are we're dealing with as a country right now, and it's not to mitigate them, not to say they're not serious, but they also are not as great of, they're not as great a challenge as other challenges the country has faced. The threat of communism, the threat of fascism, uh, civil war, the Great Depression. Um, we've gone through incredibly turbulent periods in the country's history, and as turbulent as it may seem today, it does not stack up to those other periods of time. It just the, does the, not. The, thing that, the thing that concerns me, I share uh, much of your optimism um, you didn't mention energy, but energy is a piece of that. Yeah. The changing energy uh, picture is working in our favor. There are, there are a lot of things to point to. But I worry that um, we are, uh, because of the political stasis that we have in these really, really challenging and dynamic times, that we are, we are ill-equipped to do the things that we need to do to secure the future that is within our reach. So, for example, uh, you know, when we're debating about educational standards or investments in education, when we are cutting back on research and development at a time when innovation is so important in the country, I mean, the Ebola is a, is a, an example of that because no pharmaceutical company was going to invest the money to uh, see through. Uh, a vaccine for Ebola because it wasn't economically feasible. It the government has to do certain things. You know, I always talk about Lincoln. Uh, you know, Democrats like to taunt Republicans by saying, well, my fav favorite Republican was Lincoln, <laughs> uh, but he really was. Uh, and, uh, and the reason he was was not simply because of leading the country through the Civil War or emancipating the slaves, but because while he was doing that, he also uh, created uh, the con he 
made the Transcontinental Railroad possible. He started land-grant colleges. He, he created the National Science Foundation because he understood that once the country, once the war was over, if the country was going to grow, uh, that these things were necessary and it was going to take the country acting together to make that happen. And we've, you know, we, we, we have to have that spirit, it seems to me, to maintain um, uh, to maintain our position in the world and to and to uh, empower individuals to reach their full uh, potential. You can't guarantee success for people, but you can give them the conditions to allow them to succeed, or at least a chance to succeed, like a good education. So my concern is that, um, you know, when you see sort of the political states, and you know, Steve Schmidt is a He's he's more conservative than I am, and he's a like a lot of Republicans. He's uh, I would describe as a, a smaller government Republican uh, or a small government Republican. But now we have this new breed of no government uh, people who really believe that the the the, the more you can reduce the government, uh, and if you could eliminate it completely, that would be the best. And that is to me especially in the 21st century when you look at the rest of the world and what the rest of the world is doing, that's a prescription for disaster. Yeah, I, look, I, I, I couldn't, you know, so, and those people inside the Republican Party, I think, don't understand the actual history of the Republican Party. Um, when you look at infrastructure, for example, you know, two of the greatest infrastructure projects in the history of the country, you know, um, the uh, Transcontinental Railroad, uh, the Interstate Highway Act under Eisenhower, both Republican presidents, and, and absolutely transformative uh, socially uh, for the for the country. And you know, as someone who flies in and out of Chicago every week, you know, the fact that the maniac burned down the air traffic control center, you know, causing that a level of chaos for for a month, you know, speaks you know, very decisively to the lack of modern infrastructure in our air systems. You land at an American airport versus a European or an Asian airport, it's like arriving in a third world country. It's an embarrassment. And Republicans should absolutely um, be for um, re, you know, modernizing the infrastructure. But, of, but uh, why of the isn't the party there on that issue and a range of issues? There's a Look, lot of disagreement inside. A lot my, of people say that. that my, my, criticism, my criticism of liberalism is 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 this i i don't question um the good intentions of my democratic friends and i, and I mean this serious as a heart attack um i there are many republicans who if you say why was obamacare passed the answer is because it was a plan to sabotage the country nonsense right i like think they, they sincerely believe right that they're making the country better with, with this, that, or the other. My criticism is the inability to separate good intentions from actual results. To evaluate with metrics, is this working or is it not? And so I think the Republican Party makes a enormous mistake in its candidates by going down the path of no government or anti-government rhetoric as opposed to being the country's great reform party to look at the institutions of government, many of them built and formed in the middle of the last century to modernize them, to update them, to rejuvenate them, to deliver government services with the same levels of efficiency that you see from companies like FedEx and UPS. It's entirely possible to do, to reform the civil service system, um, to, to make reform it, to our make it education about system. Innovation to make it a party about in innovation, to you know, create government services that can be bottom up, not just, not just top down. And, and, and I, we all have the experience of going to the DMV or other institutions of government, and it is not an efficient experience that mirrors at any level um, what you experience in the private sector. And you look at uh, the Veterans Administration, the outrageous wait times, 500 days for uh, returning veterans to be able to get <coughs> benefits. This is all fixable. And Republicans should be in the position of arguing to fix it, to make it efficient, uh, to, make it, to make it smaller. Um, 
but, and why aren't we but, hearing but more of that? I want to get me. David in too Be, on the Obama because, cycle. Because I think part of it is, part of it is, is well, there, there, are, there are many reasons, but you know, what, what David talks about is, is a real common thread now in the Republican Party, stalked by talk radio, government is the enemy, anti-government as opposed to small government, and, it, and it's an enormous mistake for us to go down that path. And you've got candidates more worried about being primaried in their own party on sure. both sides, but particularly the Republican Party, than they are yeah, about absolutely. Uh, really anything else in this dynamic. Absolutely. I want to come to the midterms here, but what, I, I, go ahead. What, 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 um, what concerns me is in the midst of all this is, it, I, 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 by the way, I don't disagree. I mean, having served in government, I, I, I would be the last to argue that government is, is efficient and, and uh, responsive as it should be. And I think that, you know, given the tools that we have in the 21st century that we ought to be able to apply, there's so much room to make uh, improvement. But you have to have a commitment or uh, an understanding that the functions, uh, that many of these functions are, are valuable and important. And the other thing you have to do is you, we have to be able to at least, uh, we can disagree on solutions, but we ought to be able to agree on, on the, what the challenges and problems are. Uh, you know, we can disagree on how we approach education, but we ought not to disagree on in the 21st century how important education is. We may, you know, we may disagree on how to approach climate change, but, you know, when 99% of the people who study this say, yeah, this is real, and, uh, and man is contributing to it, uh, we ought to be able to acknowledge that. We, we can't even agree on what the problems are, and that makes it very hard uh, to solve those problems, and that's a concern to me. And in terms of, uh, Steve said uh, that he's as serious as a heart attack, I will say this, there are a lot of people in this country who are, uh, have a better chance of surviving that heart attack or avoiding one today because of that health care plan, so I wouldn't be so hard on it. <laughs> but, but let me come to the president. I mean, approval ratings, um, barely at 40, depending on the poll you, you look at, the right track, wrong track number, 30% right track. Um, many in the party, most in the party, up for election of this midterm cycle are running away from the president. Um, what should the president be doing right now that, that he's not doing to help his fortunes, the country's fortunes, the party's fortunes? Well, we're 10 days from the election. I'm not sure <laughs> that uh, there's a heck of a lot that he can uh, do. Now he's going out this week into states, mostly in governor's races in blue states. Uh, and Because, you know, the challenge for Democrats in midterm elections is that a third of the voters who vote in a presidential election don't vote in midterm elections historically. And the preponderance of those voters tend to be Democrats. They have minority voters, younger voters. Uh, what's happening this year, and it's, a, and it's, it's an experiment that we'll see, uh, we'll see what the results are on November 4th, but uh, Democrats are using the techniques that we used in the battleground states in 2012, uh, big data, uh, drilling down to try and really identify those voters uh, who are drop-off voters and micro-targeting them to get them out at the polls. That's going to make a difference in a few of these races, I'm, I'm pretty confident. In terms of the president himself, though, you know, look, he, I don't, I've said publicly, I, I, it, to the chagrin of some of my friends there, that I, I, I think he framed it a little bit wrong because, you know, the Republicans would love to say that his record is on the ballot and this is all about him, and, and I don't think that's what he meant to say, but that's the way it got framed, and uh, he's done it a couple of times. I don't think that's helped uh, candidates. The history of presidents in their sixth year, even in the best of times, is not very positive, and uh, we've gone through very convulsive times. The economy's much improved, but most people aren't feeling it. Uh, and, you know, he's carrying a lot of burdens into this election. so. If I were here, I would have started about a year ago framing the forward-looking question of how we, how we build the kind of economy in which people who work hard can get ahead, how we rebuild the middle class, how we rebuild economic mobility in this country. And uh, because the truth is the Republican Party right now 
I don't think Steve would disagree with this. It's mostly a reactionary party. The Republican Party right now is not offering a lot of solutions to these problems. And that's their vulnerability. If this election had been driven in that way, I think we would have been in better shape, not necessarily great shape. Because, and this is the last point I'll make on this. Uh, because one thing we ought to understand, a lot of what's going to be, this election is going to be, I think, um, uh, rated or graded based on what happens in terms of control of the Senate. This is, we're not playing on an even playing field here. Seven Democratic, uh, in a highly polarized country, seven Democratic senators represent states that Mitt Romney carried in 2012, many of them by more than a few points. And so it would be a stunning result, honestly, I believe, if Democrats could manage to hang on to control of the Senate in, in this kind of environment with those kind of odds. Steve, what do you think the likelihood is that the Republicans will control both houses of Congress uh, I, after this I think I think it's pretty close to 100%. Um, and, and you were in Chicago, you could say 102%. You know, it's, <laughs> I think it's, look, I, I think it's pretty close to 100%. Now, now that being said, I, I do think that, um, I think you're gonna see a couple Republican governors lose. Um, their their seats. It's a. Um, and who do you think is most likely? Then? A look. I think Corbett in Pennsylvania is going to lose. I think the you know, Florida race is is very close. Um, you know, I think you know Scott Walker in Wisconsin is in a is in a is in a very tough is in a very tough race. Um, but you you know we're gonna we're gonna see a couple Republican governors go down. This is not an anti Democrat wave. You know that extends all the way across the country. David's right. Um, geographically, structurally, um, you know, it's not an even playing field in this race. You know, and, and one of the things the Republicans have done right this election cycle um, versus the previous two is, you know, we've given up six U.S. Senate seats over the last two election cycles because we nominated complete and total nutballs <laughs> in, you know, states after states. And, yeah. you know, not only, not only could they not, you know, carry independent voters, there was a fair number of Republican voters, you know, so these people have no capacity to be in the United States Senate. And, you know, therefore they, you know, they, they went down. And um, so I, I think when you look Don't at... Don't be unkind to witches with yeah, Halloween so close. Which is... <laughs> You know the you know it's quite a menagerie. You know we've <laughs> we've um, you know put forward over over the last couple of cycles. But I but I think um, you know I'm, I'm you know I and I and I'm pretty reticent to say a hundred percent. But I think it's real close to. Let me 100%. let me just say a couple of things about the Senate races though. Um, there's always surprises. Okay, there there are always surprises in these races. <clears throat> it looked like maybe Kansas would be a surprise. I still think Kansas goes native think Pat at the, Roberts holds at the on. end. You're, a, you're from that area, yeah. so you know. Yeah, I think Pat Roberts wins in the end, probably. I think South Dakota rounds the Republican candidate, wins in the end. <clears throat> but New Hampshire looks like a closer race where Scott Brown has moved next door from the last state he represented and now is running a very competitive race uh, there. But there are a couple of Democratic races that have been written in, written out, that are now closing. Um, in Georgia, uh, Michelle Nunn, the daughter of Sam Nunn, very popular former senator from uh, Georgia, is uh, in the lead in a race that many thought was, uh, was not uh, doable, primarily because her opponent uh, became, uh, ended up defending outsourcing in a very vociferous in, in kind of defiant way that wasn't to his benefit, and they've been pounding the hell out of that, and I think that race has some possibilities. Here's the other interesting one, and it goes to the point of the public mood. Um, you know, you still would have to guess that Mitch McConnell wins, but he's in a very close race, and he only won by six points last time. Being the leader of this Republican Party in Washington is not a great credential. He's the least popular incumbent running for the Senate uh, this year. And, uh, you know, despite all uh, the energy and all the odds, uh, that race is still a very close race. So um, there'll be some surprises. Uh, I said it was my last point, but I lied about that. <laughs> the other thing I would say is if you look at the Senate races, what's interesting is by and large, they follow the contours of their redness or 
or, or you know, of their color. So the deep red states, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alaska, those are tough. We're going to probably lose three in Montana, West Virginia, and South, South Dakota, Dakota, where incumbents are retiring. Uh, that's six right there that would be control of the Senate. Then you've got purple states where, uh, that are battleground states in presidential years, North Carolina, Iowa, Colorado. Those are very close races. And what are the things that determine how those races are going to tip ultimately, do you think? I mean, is this, um, is this about incumbency? Is this about the president? What, what's, what's driving? Look, I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, all of these close races, campaigns matter. And the better candidate with the better campaign in a two, three point race is going to be the candidate that wins. And so, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you just go through the states that, you know, David mentioned. Um, you know, the candidate that loses, let's say, you know, it's the, you know, the Democratic candidate loses in a purple state in a, in a close race. You know, the prevailing winds may not have been with them. But if you do, in fact, see, you know, a couple of Democrats in these close races make it over the line and some others that don't, um, you know, they'll certainly blame the national mood, the environment, they'll blame the president. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the, the candidates themselves and the races they've run and, you know, typically the campaigns that make the fewest mistakes are the ones that, that prevail in the end. And, uh, and that I will, will matter. I this. will say this, you know, all these people ran in 2008 when Obama was ascendant. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Kay Hagan probably wouldn't be in the Senate, for example, in North Carolina, Better but for him and some of the others benefited from uh, the push he gave them then. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see now what the recriminations are. But uh, I, as I pointed out before, I think that this micro-targeting and some of the work that's being done, and you see it in the early voting and in the applications for, uh, for vote by mail, uh, in a lot of these states, um, and we see it here in Illinois, by the way, first time that that's being done here, you're seeing sporadic voters, voters who didn't vote in 2010, who, but vote in 2012, coming out disproportionately for absentee ballots, early vote ballots. In Illinois, I think the number, last number I saw was uh, that 38% uh, uh, of the people who asked for ballots were people who hadn't voted in 2010, and 71% of those were Democrats. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I think if the races are genuinely tied and there's no momentum that carries a candidate forward, which is generally what happens, these, these projects will make a difference. I, I want to ask you um, a question using the Illinois gubernatorial race as an example of this. Um, just heard a figure this morning um, from Professor Emeritus Kent Redfield, who studied campaign finance in Illinois for years and, and around the country, that the latest tally of expenditures um, combined in the gubernatorial race is now more than $91 million. Um, now, that's, that's a big number, but, you know, relative to what? Well, it, we're on pace now to be um, double total expenditures versus the 2010 campaign, actually, which was itself a record. But you and I have talked a little bit about this, David. I think maybe you and Steve have talked about it. Um, beyond just sort of the, the, the wow factor of the number, um, the number of ads that we're seeing in this state on that race, in, uh, in Iowa on the Senate race, wh what's it getting the campaigns in terms of their overall investment here in, in TV time? We're, unchar we're in uncharted territory. Um, there are numbers I heard in Iowa a couple of weeks ago. This isn't even at the end. They had each side had 7,000 gross rating points. People will see 70 ads uh, a week from these campaigns. I mean, I think what and and, um, and 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 they're they're largely negative. I mean, it just I think it contributes to the sour mood. Yeah. Uh, and and there is a question of efficacy. You know. Uh, a mutual friend of ours, Mike Murphy, who's, who's on the board of the IOP, another Republican consultant, said uh, the other day that, you know, if a grand piano falls on your head, you don't need another grand piano to fall on your head. The first, <laughs> first one does the job. And uh, so I think that, you know, there's going to be there's going to be an evaluation of this after 
the question is, can we stop that we're, we're in like this mad proliferation here? And, you know, the notion is, well, if they've got 5,000 gross rating points, we have to have 5,000 gross rating points. Yeah, it's an arms not, race. Not, it, it is an arms race. And I don't know how, you know, we're, we're spending four times as much this year, at least, as we were just a few uh, years ago. These outside groups are now in these battleground states in these big races. They displace the party as, the, as, as, as major funders of the oligarchs who are now funding candidates. Um, it's really out of control. And I don't think it's, I, I, I think you pass a point of effectiveness and it becomes, it may become counterproductive, but I don't know if people can stop. I don't know what you, where you think this is going. I, I think that, you know, I had the experience in, in the 2012 campaign. I was living in Nevada, uh, a, a swing state. And it was the first race in 20 years that I, that I was doing no campaign. So I was a normal person sitting at home and, you know, but not a disinterested observer watching watching the ads. And I would try, now this may speak to my attention deficit disorder more <laughs> than the efficacy of the ads, but I would, I would try to watch the five minute block on whatever show, and it was all wall to wall negative ads. And you know, after two, two and a half minutes, it would just short circuit my brain. Um, I was seeing golden retrievers running around fields. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, in my that mind's was, that eye, was the Viagra, and um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, um, and so I, I don't think they're, I don't think that they're particularly effective. I mean, I think that if you communicate with 5,000 gross rating points, you're gonna have 70 ads, and the, and the ads are loaded with negative information. You know, 100, you know, negative, you know, data points of, you know, what a horrible person this is. Uh, there's no thematic connection to them. I think that you can use advertising to communicate a couple of big things and big ideas. I don't think it's a particularly effective medium to communicate hundreds of little things. And I think these ads accumulate to communicating hundreds of little things that may form an impression, and generally that impression is we hate both of these people. Yeah. Um, and. Um, so I think that you know, when, I, when, I, when I look back over my career in political advertising, and I think the Obama campaign was, was effective on this by going early in 2012, and you understood uh, the big point that the campaign was trying to, trying to get across. And you know, the way that politics works is the pollsters will come in and you know, they'll say that, you know, look, you know, this issue, you know, we ought to put this issue in the ad, this issue in the ad, this issue in the ad. And the way that the ads roll out, it's chapter seven followed by chapter nine, followed by chapter 32, followed by chapter two, and it doesn't make any sense. You know, when you, when you accumulate it all together, there's not a narrative flow, you know, where you're telling a story. And I increasingly, I think that as more money is spent, the less narrative is being presented in a way that is simply throwing negative information against the wall doesn't make you know an overall thematic argument in case. And, and, and more difficult and even now with the yeah, outside groups because the campaign and, isn't controlling the and, narrative. And, and, and there and there is you know and I you know I have a prejudice on this having spent a lot of time in California, but I think a lot of trends you know come out of California for good and for bad in the rest of the country. And I think California has answered the question, and it was in Meg Whitman's race. Can you spend too much money in a political campaign and advertising? And I, and I think in 2010, you know, that question was answered. And the answer was yes, you can, in a way that you know, backfires on you um, and doesn't communicate anything to anyone. Fascinating. Let's take your questions. And um, we have uh, microphones roaming through. Put your hand up, and we'll get a microphone over to you. And uh, yes, sir. We'll bring your microphone up here. Yeah, it should be on. Go ahead, sir. Okay, so as I've seen and heard you on uh, any number of uh, talk shows, the thing, the kind of well-reasoned, nuanced, you know, point of view that you uh, do in, in your analysis of situations is markedly different from um, many of your uh, Republican colleagues. Very few people I see, especially those who are elected, are willing to uh, lay out that kind of analysis. That being the case, I'm wondering why are you still in business and who hires you and why? 
<laughs> Look, I, um, you know, I haven't done a, my last, the last campaign I did was in 2010, uh, was Mark Kirk's uh, U.S. Senate race. Um, I mainly work today for businesses, you know, professional sports franchises, some nonprofits, academic institutions, and you know, do the political analysis and commentary. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, it's just a matter of personal preference and style. Um, I try to give reasoned analysis, not to be another bomb thrower out there. And I and I would say that. You know, part of the, and David, you know, I alluded to this earlier, there are plenty of very serious people in both political parties, you know, but all of the incentives are for the crazy people, you know, to be out on television. And so we've gone through this transition where, you know, not too long ago, if you were a member of the House of Representatives who screamed out, you lie, at the President of the United States during the State of the Union, um, most every member of Congress would say that you should resign your seat for disgracing yourself. Um, today, um, the return on that is probably $2 million on online donations. And um, so there's a lot of incentives um, that reward the crazy. And that's too bad. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm not optimistic about the about the future. But understand, there are there are many many serious people involved in government in the political parties. You may not see them on the cable shows, but they're out there. Let me let me just add something to this. If the Republican Party is to have a future as a national party, they're going to have to adjust. I mean, the the course they're on is not a sustainable course. The demographics of the country speak to that. And um, you, you, can't, you can't be the crazy party and, uh, and succeed. And so I, I think Steve is uh, a younger man than he looks. <laughs> and uh, I think that he's, he's wise to wait out the storm and his day will come. I just want to say, um, after running a race against David um, and Maybe it could have been something to do with our vice presidential nominee, but there was a, um, <laughs> but there was a, um, there was a picture of me. I never had a great deal of hair, uh, but what hair I had in August of 2008 was 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 definitively brown, um, and there's a picture taken a week after the election, and it is entirely white. <laughs> over the over the course of um, over the course of twelve weeks, um, I but um, look one of the things about the Republican Party is this: um, the Republican Party historically, founded in 1854, um, is was the abolitionist party. It is a northern party and a western party in its orientation. By 1858, it's the majority party in all of the northern states. After the Civil Rights Movement, beginning with Richard Nixon's Southern Strategy in 68 and really culminating with the 88 campaign, the Republican Party begins a transition. And by 1988, the transition is complete. George Herbert Walker Bush gets 59.5% of the white vote, roughly the same number that Mitt Romney will get in 2012. He has an overwhelming electoral college landslide victory. After that election, the Republican Party loses the popular vote in five out of the next six elections. Why is it? Because the Republican Party has become the Southern Party. And the Southern Party never has and never will win presidential elections in this country. The party that controls the North and the West is the party that wins presidential elections. Now, the Southern Party can be a majority congressional party. It can be a majority congressional party for a long time. But it is just the case that in every single demographic group in this country that is growing, the Democratic Party is gaining market share. Every single demographic group in this country that is shrinking, the Republican Party is gaining market share. And if you work in marketing for a living, which I do, that's an enormous marketing problem. <laughs> and um, if, you, if you look at the states that you know, Democrats have won six out of the last six elections, there are 242 electoral votes with 270 needed to win. Very, very difficult uh, as a matter of mathematics uh, to put together the coalition necessary 
when the other side starts out with 242 electoral votes. And it's near impossible uh, to get elected to the presidency without getting about 40% of the Hispanic vote you know, nationally. And, and when you look at the state of California, um, something remarkable will happen late in 2016, early 2017. For the first time since the Republican Party was founded, going back, like I said, to 1854, where we've had basically stable two-party system in the country, one of those two parties will slip into a third-party status. And that will happen in California, where decline to state or independent registrations will exceed registered Republicans. Why is that? That is fundamentally uh, because of the 1994 um, P. Wilson for Governor campaign where the Republican Party won an election but mortgaged its future with a low interest loan and a giant balloon payment that has come due by antagonizing Latinos and Hispanics in the state that used to vote for Republican candidates at right around that 40% number. It's where they performed uh, for Ronald Reagan right around that number. And now Latinos in the state you know, are in the low teens for Republican candidate. When that happens um, in a state like California and you look at the demographics of other states, what it means is it will collapse the Republican Party. And in the state of California, I would argue, in a two-party system, even if you are the most partisan Democrat, I can assure you this, in a two-party system, you need both parties to function in order for there to be for there to be good government. And California is a disaster at many levels because of the collapse of the opposition party and to, to have any level of effectiveness in opposition there, at all. There are a lot of obvious follow-ups, yeah. but I want to be sensitive to those of you who have questions here. Yes. Uh, I have a question concerning the Citizens United uh, decision in the Supreme Court. Uh, the perception is that the Koch brothers are attempting to purchase the government and buy it out. Um, the Republican Party has gone after Obamacare with zeal. Uh, how come there's not a big pushback, or will there ever be a pushback on the Citizens United case, or is that big money here to stay? David, do you want to take that? Wow. Um, the, I mean, the Supreme Court has spoken on this, and I think until the Supreme Court um, uh, the Supreme Court uh, takes a different avenue, and there's some sense that there's some su surprise, at least on the part of some on the court, as to how this whole thing has unfolded. I, I think it is what it is. The, the thing that, uh, the most insidious thing to me um, is that more than ever, a lot of the spending is going on uh, through uh, uh, 501c4, 501c6s, I guess, but organizations that don't have to disclose where the money is coming from. And you hear a lot on the side, uh, on, uh, from uh, folks on the Republican side, well, we, that we, we shouldn't have to disclose, no one should have to disclose because then the, you know, the, gut, the, the force of the government can be used against the people who are... I, I think we need you know, total disclosure of where this money is coming from, but in terms of... I don't see any quick solution to the... Uh, influx of money other than if those folks t conclude that it's a bad investment. And the truth is for the Koch brothers, it hasn't been a bad investment. When you look at the composition of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and the number of members there who, have, who are actively supported by the Koch brothers who are in that industry and have a hugely... Um, uh, uh, not to say that they don't have philosophical and ideological reasons to do what they're doing, but their business interests are very well represented on that committee. Um, so uh, I don't, you know, I don't see a lot of, sadly, I don't see a lot of change in the system anytime soon. Look, I think that the Citizen United decision was an entirely predictable result of McCain-Feingold. And a lot of us who were opposed to the McCain-Feingold legislation, you know, predicted what has happened is, you know, what is happening now was, was going to happen. Um, the, the reality is, is that we've had a 30, 40 year campaign finance regime in the country where the reformers go out and say essentially that there are different categories of money in politics. Some are worse, some are better. And they move the money around the political system like squeezing air in a balloon 
it moves it to a different part of the balloon, but it's the same amount of air in the balloon. And chiefly what we have done is we have pulled the money out of the candidate committees and out of the party committees, and it has gone to the outside groups now. So in most every single congressional race and not a few U.S. Senate races, the outside groups have bigger voices than the candidates and the parties. And the political parties have always been stabilizing and moderating influences in American politics because the political parties are in the business of trying to put together majorities, and that includes accommodating diverse views within the party. Um, what unites everybody is trying to win not 100% agreement on every issue. Reagan talked about this when he said, someone who agrees with me 80% of the time is not my political opponent. And so I think the only remedy to this is that you pass reform laws that take off any caps on the size of the donations, have instant disclosure, but they have to go into the candidate committees, they have to go, they, or they can be allowed to go into the candidate campaign committees, they can be allowed to go into the parties, and I think what that essentially does is it de 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 it, it dis it's a disincentive for people to put a lot of money into these, into these outside groups. But David is absolutely correct when he says that there should be full disclosure. Let's take another question just, here. Just one more. Last one. Oh, my goodness. Yes. What can we do to initiate term limits, which the majority of Americans desire? Look, I, I think you have term limits every two years. It's, you know, if you, you, you know, vote, you know, vote these people out if you don't, if you don't like them. And, and I will say, again, California is a state with, with term limits. And, you know, the law of unintended consequences shouldn't, shouldn't be discounted. In practical effect, the way the state of California now runs is, you know, let's say Bob Jones is the assemblyman. Well... Bob will be in the assembly for his entire term, and then typically he'll move over to the state senate. His wife will then run for the assembly, right. do her term, and then the chief of staff will run, um, and then the deputy chief of staff will run. And, uh, you know, the, the net effect of all of it is that you, in a democracy, right, where do you want power vested? You want it vested, imperfect though they may be, with the actual elected officials, not the permanent staff. And so term limits are not a panacea. And what I would argue is that what is a panacea to unaccountable elected officials is an engaged electorate and right. citizenry. Right. Yeah, I would actually th say that the power in a democracy ought to be vested in people. And, but with that comes a responsibility. You know, I think we, we actually give the voting public more of a pass than they deserve. When you look at the number of people who participate in these primaries, for example, often very, very low, and then they lament the kind of candidates who, who emerge from these primaries. So, you know, I, I, I'm not willing to give people a pass. You get the democracy that you deserve in some ways. You want to overcome some of these forces. Get out and vote. And uh, we, really, we really need, as Steve says, the electorate to make its voice heard. That's a fitting note, and I want to have all of you join me in thanking David Axelrod and Steve Schmidt. Thank you guys so much for inviting us. And thank you thank all you. for being here.